want to say good morning to everybody uh, who's with us here in person and also with us online. I invite you to stand if you would please. And uh, we're going to begin our time this morning uh, with a course that just uh, speaks to no matter uh, what the, the great things, no matter what the difficult things, that uh, we know that we can bring our praise to the Lord. And I want to show you that this morning. It goes like this. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. Let's try that together. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. I count on one thing. Same God that never fails will not fail. Won't fail me now in the waiting. Same God's never late, is working all things out. You're working all things out. Say, Yes, I will. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley.
Welcome to HCC. My name is Jordan Tuttle, and I'm one of the ministers on staff here. And we are so excited that you've uh, chosen to join us in worship this morning, whether in person or if you're joining us online. Uh, if you are new with us this morning, we'd love to invite you to our connection point, which is out in the lobby right after the service. Uh, you'll see Mary Beth and, and, and Sue, and you'll see a, a welcome center sign there. Uh, we'd love to get to know more about you as well as give you a gift and share a few things about how to get connected here at HCC. We'd love for you to join in our family here at HCC. Uh, one quick thing, uh, if, you, if you are new, you could also text WELCOME to our, our text in church number, which is 740-303-7898, and that works if you're here in person or if you're online. You text the word WELCOME to 740-303-7898, and you will get an automated reply uh, which will then be able to connect you to one of our ministry staff team members. Uh, again, we'd love to connect with you and, and give you more information on how to connect, whether it's in a small group uh, or just connect here with the body of Christ uh, here at HCC. Uh, one of my good friends, uh, his name is Anthony. Uh, I, I met him in Columbus uh, a few years back, and now we support him as a missionary. He is asking uh, us for prayer uh, right now. He is currently a missionary in East Africa, and he is on the run. Uh, he is being pursued by the government and uh, his, a couple of his uh, friends and people that are working on his team with him have already been taken into custody, uh, and they are trying to flee the country that they are in currently. Uh, so we need to be in prayer for him for safety, uh, but also to continue to pray for boldness, for the gospel to be proclaimed in this situation. Uh, we, I, I know Anthony, and I know Anthony's heart, and he, he knows that God will take what the enemy means for evil, and he'll turn it into good. Uh, and, and I know that Anthony believes that in his heart. And so I'm, I'm excited to see how God works through this, but I'm also fervently praying uh, for, for safety in this situation. So uh, would you stand with me once again? Uh, I know we just sat down, but would you stand with me as we continue worshiping this morning? And would you pray for Anthony with me? God, we are so grateful for who you are. Uh, we, we know that you are a God that never fails us. And God, we know that you love us so much that you would, you would go to any any length to reach us, that you would, that you would reach us in, in any way. Uh, God, we, we know that your, your love is so vast, and, and, and we thank you that we have an opportunity to come into this building or, or uh, tune in online and worship you and praise your name. God, we pray that your name alone would be glorified uh, today. God, we pray for our friend Anthony, our brother Anthony, that, that you would keep him safe, uh, that you would keep his team members safe, but also that your name would be spread because of this, uh, that your love would be seen by the humility, by the, by the love that, that Anthony and his, his, his team members show uh, to the people in his area. God, we trust in you, and we trust in you for their safety, uh, but God, we also trust in you uh, for the gospel to be, to be spread. We pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. We're going to sing about the love of God that has no borders has no limits. Let's sing together. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath. So, so kind to me. 
It is Christ uh, who is God's love put into flesh. And we worship him and we recognize that he is the only way to connect us to the Father. That this love that we sing about, this love that we enjoy, this love that we proclaim to others comes through the life of Jesus. And we use this song as, as an opportunity just to bring testimony and worship and praise uh, to, to God. But also the, just to share that word and encourage those around us as, as what we know that Jesus means in our lives. All that he's done. And this is the gospel message put into the form of song. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. Striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love. Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on the cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied And every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ From the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood. commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns me home here in the power of Christ I stand. Thank you for singing.
sing you with us. I encourage you to be seated at this time. And uh, we're going to hear the words of Scripture uh, read, read to us as we begin to uh, transition into a moment of thinking about all these things and what it means for our lives. Let's take a listen as Tim reads from the book of Acts this morning. Good morning. Uh, this morning I'll read from Acts 1, verses 12 through 14. If you would like to turn there or follow along on the screen. Again, that is Acts 1, verses 12 through 14. It says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the name of those who were in it or who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. Thank you for your prayers for Anthony. He's a good friend of ours, a recent graduate of Ohio State. We'll continue to pray for him. I understand we had an excellent turnout and beginning of the path this morning. We are glad that you are here and uh, for those who are online. A church was sending out its annual report to the headquarters, and in the report they had to reveal the stats from the past year. Included in the stats, they responded this way, number of confessions of faith, Zero. Number of baptisms, zero. Number of transfers, zero. Number of new groups that have been born, zero. At the bottom of their report, there was a handwritten note that simply said this Please pray for us that we would be faithful. Faithful to what? You know, do you understand the frustration? in that report. Maybe you've been part of a fellowship of that nature. You look for results. You look for evidence that God is doing something, and it's zero. You know, there is a sense in which the group of disciples that Jesus brought around him during the years of his ministry on the earth, as you look at their last year, when they turned in their stats, they very easily could have responded in the same way. Zero, zero, zero. And it only got worse when Jesus was crucified because as the disciples gathered around the cross and they saw the horror of what was happening, do you remember what happened to his followers? They were scattered. And so this small band of followers is working an uphill battle. But that's why we come to the book of Acts, and that's why we find hope. That's why it's encouraging for us, and that's why last Sunday we started this movement series. And that's why we want to invite you as well to come and join us and just to discover what God loves to do when there is no hope. We come to Acts chapter 1. We pick up the story where we left it last week, and we're entering into the final days before the day of Pentecost. When Jesus came back from the grave, as we just sang, something inspired these disbanded, disconnected followers to come back together. Jesus hung out with his men, gave them many convincing principles or uh, many convincing uh, evidences that he had been resurrected from the grave. Hope was reborn. Momentum began to build. A vision was cast, but there were still some things that needed to happen for God to take this small, disgruntled band of men and also some women and begin a movement that would know no boundaries and still is pushing forward today. 
I'd like to invite you, as we just read, to turn with me to Acts chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 14. And in these verses, we want to uncover some of the cost of Pentecost. The word Pentecost has the word in it. So what did it cost these individuals for God to want to gift them as he did in Acts chapter 2? Now, it is very important that we remember these individuals could never cause what was going to happen in Acts chapter 2. There was nothing humanly possible that they could do. But there were conditions that needed to be met before God would be able to gift them with his presence as he does in chapter 2. Another way of saying it would be this. We would never have Acts chapter 2 if it were not for Acts chapter 1. What was God doing? What were these believers doing? What chemistry was happening among them in order for the conditions to be right so that at the right time, at the right moment, and doing the right things, God would bless them And this come from behind victory like we have never witnessed would be released. And it is working in our midst today. This is stimulating. This is hope filling content. So let's go to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to dig into verses 12 and following just to uncover some of the cost of Pentecost. What had to happen for the conditions to be right. In chapter 1, verse 12, we read, uh, reiterating what Tim just read for us. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. The cost of obedience. Dr. Luke, who is writing, recording this story for us, for Theophilus, knew that Theophilus probably would never visit Jerusalem. So he gives them a little geographical information. Where's the starting point? The Mount of Olives, okay? That's just a a hill, a pretty big hill outside of Jerusalem, but it is a Sabbath day away, a Sabbath day's walk away. According to Jewish law, you could only walk seven-eighths of a mile before it became work. Seven-eighths of a mile is pleasure, but once you cross that line, then it becomes effort and work. And so it was a Sabbath day's walk away. If you were walking out of our building today and you took 2,000 steps forward, in other words, about seven-eighths of a mile, you probably could make it down to Super 8 Hotel. You could rest there until tomorrow. (laughs) But that's about how far they had to walk. Now, they went to Jerusalem, probably to the temple, And that's where they had been instructed to go. If you'll remember, last Sunday we talked about, in verse 4, the instruction Jesus had given his disciples. In chapter 1, verse 4, he says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. Very same thing, in essence, is what he had told them from the book of Luke in the earlier version of the gospel Luke 24, 49, stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. You know, Jesus could have told them to go just about anywhere if he wanted to, but why Jerusalem? Why Jerusalem? Remember what had just happened to Jesus there days earlier. What did they do to Jesus in Jerusalem? He was crucified. These men very likely could have gone back to Galilee because that's where they had their homes and their businesses. But Jesus tells them to go back to Jerusalem. Sometimes we have to face our fears. Go back and wait. He could have told them to go to Jericho, to Jordan, Jacksonville, Johnstown, you know, all the... But he says, Jerusalem, go back to Jerusalem. You need to overcome some fears, and you need to wait. Now, we'll understand here in a minute that waiting does not necessarily mean that you're idle, but there is a season that God wanted to work through before the conditions could be right. 
If they would have not obeyed this instruction, if they would have waited in another place when the Spirit of God came down, they would have been at the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing, and they would have missed the blessing. So they had to remember how critical it is to be obedient to what Christ had to say. God told Elijah back in the Old Testament, I want you to go down to the Kirith Ravine, and there I will meet you, and you will be fed by the ravens. Did Elijah go? He went, he did, and he was sustained by the ravens for a season of his life. The, the big general, Naaman, from the Syrian army was told, if you want to get rid of your leprosy, you need to go to the Jordan River and dip seven times. Did God meet him there? He did, and on that seventh time under, he came up, and his flesh was as good as a baby boy. Are you in the right place at the right time doing the right thing? God really wants to lavish his blessing on our lives, but it's critical that we understand the cost of obedience, to be where we need to be, doing what we need to do at the right time. I was reading with my accountability partner this past week with... Uh, Jordan, we were, we're going through the book of Matthew. We came across the story in Matthew chapter 12. Jesus is in the middle of a lesson with a house full of people. And right in the middle of the lesson, probably getting to a very important point, somebody comes through the crowd, pulls his, his robe and says, Hey, buddy, uh, your mother, your brothers, your family, they're at the door. They would like to speak with you. What do you do when you're in the middle of a lesson and your family's standing at the door, and of all things, your mom is probably the one in the doorway. Jesus took that opportunity and used it as a teaching opportunity to the crowd. He looked over the crowd, and then he said these words, Who is my mother, and who are my brothers? Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and mother. There's such a critical piece of obedience if we want to be part of this family thing that Jesus wants to invite us to be part of. You know, it's been widely assumed that the more regular a person attends church, listens to a sermon, or listens to a lesson, the more likely there will be spiritual transformation in the life of the hearer. But friends, do you know that is not necessarily true? Just because I hang out Sunday after Sunday and occupy a seat does not guarantee my spiritual change. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's pretend I go to see my doctor once a week. Each week he talks to me about a healthy lifestyle, good diet, the importance of exercise, a consistent sleeping rhythm, taking the necessary vitamins. And at each visit, all the vitals are taken. He checks to see how tall I am, how much I weigh, my blood pressure. But do my frequent visits to the doctor ensure that I am physically well? No. What if I don't do anything he tells me to do? like some of you and some of me. We don't always listen to what the doctor has to say. I might be encouraged, I might be educated, and I might give the appearance, at least of going to the doctor more often than anybody else does, but that does not guarantee that I am changing or healthy spiritually. Research indicates that there's so much more to the spiritual change in a person, and one of the first is not just hearing, but obeying. We need relationships with people who are trying to move forward, taking steps forward. We need to be exposed regularly to the Word of God, but we also need to put it into practice, and furthermore, we need accountability. We need people who call us to the carpet and ask how we're progressing. Mark Twain, the humorist, one time said it this way. If you hold a cat by the tail, you'll learn some things you cannot learn any other way. Sometimes you just got to do it. The first cost of Pentecost 
I think for these disconnected men and women was simply to rediscover the critical nature of obedience. Let's do what Jesus told us to do and see what happens. They were in the right place at the right time doing the right thing, and God wanted to bless that effort. We continue in verse 13. We find another cost in the Pentecost, the cost of reconciliation. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were, and uh, we heard these words, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bar. You know, when I was in junior high, we had a lot of fun with that name, uh, Barfall on you. We, we, we barf on you. <laughs> Matthew, James, Alpheus. So in, in essence, what we have are 11 names of the followers of Christ, just in verse 13, the individual names. This is the first meeting of the first Christian church. How did it start? They took attendance. That's just in our blood. And I had to throw that out there, all right? Took attendance. Peter here, Andrew here, James, I, John. You get 11 names, but there's one guy missing. Who's missing? Judas Iscariot. The gory story of Judas Iscariot is in the agenda minutes, and they follow right after this taking of the attendance. And you can read that with your small group and uh, discover what happened to Judas but it's interesting in this meeting that they went to an upper room or an upstairs room. Uh, some versions actually translate it literally, the upper room. It's very possible. It's the same room where Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples. And so they're coming to a large upper room. Some of the more fluent people in Jerusalem in that era of life had as part of their home a large, wider, open room, kind of like a big TV room or your rec room, big living room. Apparently it was a pretty big room because verse 15 talks about 120 people were occasionally getting together during these 10 days and they were praying together. So it must have been a pretty elaborate place. But that's where they went during these 10 days. But I want you to consider with me the chemistry of these people going into this moment. If we think back to the crucifixion, the events surrounding the crucifixion, what was the chemistry of this team before the resurrection? What had Peter done just prior to the crucifixion of Jesus? What did he do? He denied the Lord three times. Then we think about John and James. What was their request at the Last Supper? John and James asked to be given the best seats in the house. In the kingdom. You think that set pretty well with everybody else on the team? And then you think about Thomas. What did Thomas do even after the resurrection of Christ? He publicly doubted, unless I see it with my eyes and touch with my fingers, the holes, I won't believe it. So we have a doubter. And then we dig into verse 14. We find another tear to this story because we find also that there are women there. Included in this group of women, there's a lady by the name of Mary Magdalene. Uh, do you remember her past? She had been delivered of seven demons, so she has a pretty checkered past. She's there. Then we have the very closing phrase there. We have the brothers. Whose brothers? The brothers of Jesus. Now, this is a fascinating understory to the whole thing because the brothers of Jesus are recorded as part of the story of Christ throughout the four gospels. But here's the kicker. They didn't believe. Now they were not full-blooded brothers. They were half brothers. Jesus was born of a virgin. They were not. Let's just make sure we're clear here. But they were half brothers and they didn't believe. They thought he was crazy. They thought he was out of his mind. But something has happened in their lives since that time so that now after the resurrection and after the ascension, during these final 10 days, moving into the day of Pentecost, Jesus' brothers are there. We even know their names. I think there were five brothers and one sister. But two of them, 
became so prominent in this newly found faith that they wrote books to record their story and give their teaching. And do you know who their names are today? They're part of your New Testament. James and Jude. The book of James and Jude were half-brothers to Christ. They're there in this crowd. I think there were some pretty big relational scars that they were dealing with during these final 10 days leading up to the day of Pentecost. I had some brothers while we were living in Venezuela that taught me a lesson that I'll never forget about the role of reconciliation. And they uh, simply illustrated it this way by using light. Based on what we learned from 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, there's a very simple principle that says this. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we will have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of Christ will cleanse us of all of our sins. So let me illustrate it this way. Let's pretend that we have two lights representing two lives. There has been a conflict between the two, but we're seeking reconciliation. What does this verse help me to see? If we, me and him, walk in the light, in other words, we're both coming to the light, we can have, we will have fellowship one with the other. Now, what does light do? Think about this. What does light do? What are some things that light does? It exposes, it, it reveals, it discloses, it takes away what we can't see, it takes away the mystery, it, it brings about transparency, authenticity. So if I walk in the light, I'm being fully vulnerable. I, am, I'm, I have no hidden agenda. I just lay my heart out. If this brother lays his heart out, if we're really walking in the light, we will have fellowship one with the other. We'll work through it. And not only that, but the blood of Christ will cleanse us of all sins. What does darkness do? Darkness discloses, it hides. Well, that's just a private part of my life. I'm not going to talk about it. But in doing so, we can inevitably isolate or break fellowship with people. And sometimes we just need to be transparent, vulnerable, open up our hearts. And if the other person is willing to do the same, eventually we can work through our conflict and come together in the light. Now, that, that also brings up some questions. Do I just do this before everybody? Not necessarily. I think it's helpful. It talks more about a one-on-one -on -one relationship here. We have fellowship one with the other. But it also reveals some very important things about marriage, how to keep a marriage together, how to keep a family together, how to keep a country, a city together. And it also tells me this, that if one of the two is walking in darkness, what's going to happen? If we're not in fellowship together, somebody is walking in darkness. Somebody is hiding part of themselves. They're not laying their heart on the table. They're not being fully authentic. Does this surprise God that there would be relational conflict? Not at all. And that's why I think we have that promise in there because it says we'll have fellowship one with another, but also in doing so when we're fully transparent, when we work together in the light, the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sins. You know, I read this story of these, the core of Jesus' followers in light of all that they had went through. And now in these 10 days before the day of Pentecost, you know what I think a lot of was taking place? I think there was a lot of 1 John 1, 7 happening in that room 
as they began to work and fully disclose and apologize and reconcile. And the heat is building in this nucleus on this come from behind victory. The cost of reconciliation. But moving into verse, uh, or let, let's just throw this out here. I, 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 I think this is such an incredible promise. In the book of Psalms 133, verse 1 through 3, and, and I just want to make this uh, disclosure that I, I do not understand all the biblical symmetry or imagery because uh, sometimes I get a little bit confused and one of them is in the promise of this psalm. I understand the first and the last part. You guys help me understand the middle. The psalm says this, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Isn't that wonderful? It is like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. I don't think his mother was going to be very happy when he got home and had to do the laundry. But for some reason, that imagery is in there. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, something spectacular, something beautiful. Apparently, the, the sweet smell of this anointing oil, and it's there. This is where we need to connect. Where? There. There the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Where does the blessing occur? In verse 1. When God's people live together in unity. The cost of Pentecost. Working through our differences. Understanding. Forgiving. And coming back together. Maybe there are some relationships that we need to work on this week. Maybe there's an estranged person in our life. God wants to pour out his blessing. He commands his blessing where people can come together and live in unity as we walk in the light. Verse 14 expresses another cost of Pentecost. Here it talks about not just being idle during these 10 days. What were they doing during these 10 days leading up to Pentecost? Praying, constantly praying. There was a lot of prayer going on during these final 10 days because prayer is so often repeated in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, every chapter you read through the book of Acts, almost without exception, has somebody praying. There's just a lot of prayer going on. It's a reminder that that's part of our DNA. That's why we have the priority of prayer as one of our values, and that's one of the IOU challenges. Don't forget those IOU challenges. We'll be measuring them and revealing where we stand at the end of this month, the time praying for people that are still disconnected from the Lord. But I want you to notice who's in this crowd that we have not cast our attention on. Kind of like taking the laser light and drilling it down onto this one individual who is mentioned by name, but we've not mentioned yet in this story. Go into verse 14, towards the end of verse 14. Whose name is mentioned there? An individual who we have not discussed. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Why is she so significant in this group? Here's the kicker. This is the last time that Mary is mentioned in the Bible story. What is she doing? She's praying. She's not praying or they are not praying to her. The rest are praying with her. We don't see a bunch of candles that are burning in honor of her, but rather she's praying with everybody else to her own son, Jesus. Isn't that powerful? The last photograph we have of Mary before she fades out of the historical picture and she's praying with everybody else that God would shake this place. The cost of intercession and prayer. And if she's doing it and the 12 are doing it, the women are doing it, the 120 are doing it, imagine the impact when 120 people get together and they are praying for the same thing. That is powerful. That's what Jesus is looking for when he wants to bless with his presence and favor. And it moves us into the last cost. 
It's one that's kind of suggested in that very same phrase, but depending on the Bible translation you have, it may spell it out differently. One of the versions, for example, the New International Version simply says they joined together in prayer, constantly in prayer. Others would say completely together. I like a one century version says it together with a single purpose in mind. The old King James Version you probably got back in elementary school, just simply said they were of one accord. Maybe you remember the old Bible joke, what car did the disciples used to drive? They drove a Honda because they were all in one accord, right? You remember that story. Yeah, that was a bad one, wasn't it? <laughs> but the original word here, it, it, it's captivated or captured in that simple idea of being of one accord. The Greek word is very fascinating. I don't speak Greek, but I can read occasionally bits and pieces of it. The word is homo thumaden. Of course, you know the word homo means to be same, to be together, and thumos is the word for passion, heat, pain, spirit, a glow. You put those words together and it literally means that the chemistry on this team, they were all together in the same heat, the same passion, the same purpose, and God was welding them back together. That word for thumos is, you can kind of see the word a thermos or a thermometer. You get the idea of the heat that is involved when they're of one accord. Let me just ask in another way. Have you ever noticed that whenever you walk into a church, each church has a unique temperature? Now, when we're not here on Sundays, the temperature in this place drops significantly. There, there's no need to burn all the, the fuel during the week to keep everything heated. So primarily we heat the offices and that's a little challenge for me, especially when I need to step out of the office. Uh, for about 30 years of our life, we lived in a country where temperatures in the 80s and 90s were just common every day. I worked in an office in the 90s, no air conditioning. You just work through it. And then I step out of an office where it's 70 degrees and it's 60 degrees outside the door. And all of a sudden, my body feels it. I, I have an incredible admiration for Dave Wetzel and how he can walk around in shorts and it's 20 degrees outside. But these guys were coming together in the same heat, the same passion, the same purpose. And when we talk about the church of a temperature or the, the, the temperature in a church, we're not talking so much about the thermostat and what the furnace can do, but we're talking about something that every single one of us brings to the big family picture. We're talking about an intensity, a love, a concern that begins to bring us together and to make us a family. I read the sad story of a man who, after he went to church one Sunday, sat down and wrote these words about his own church. He said, I go to God's house and I find no God. I don't hear his voice in song. I don't hear it in the sermon. I don't feel it in the grip of the handshake of other Worshippers, I feel no longings. I hear no longings for the lost in the message of the preacher. I don't see it in the face of the people. There is no God in the temple where my people worship. Have you ever been to a place like that? What a sad commentary. But friends, this is the challenge for us. We don't have to go to a church like that. We have the privilege to turn the heat up. We have the privilege to ignite the passion, to come together. We all have a role in this, and it was one of the conditions that God was looking for before he would pour out his spirit and bless this tiny fledgling movement. Dr. W.A. Criswell from Dallas, a great man of the Lord in the past century, wrote this one time about the church. He said, a refrigerator can keep something cool but it can never bring it back to life. An egg, if it's to be hatched, needs to be placed under the warm feathers of the mother hen or in an incubator. 
If a rose bush is to blossom, it must be bathed by the warm winds of the spring. The only difference between an iceberg that sunk the Titanic and the bosom of the ocean that bore it up was a matter of temperature. It's no different, he said, in the Lord's house. A cold corpse cannot bear new life, but the warm body can produce the life that God wants to give. It's the warmth of the church. It's the spiritual temperature of her people that makes the matrix, the womb in which new life is born into God. You know, we are living in a day with this pandemic where just about every place you go, what's the first thing to do when you step into the door? Put your head out there, take your temperature, what's your temperature? Wouldn't it be an incredible thing if every building you stepped into, there was the ability to take your spiritual temperature? What if you went into work tomorrow morning and somebody said, let's check your spiritual temperature, your pulse. You go home. You're there with your spouse, your family. What's your spiritual temperature? You come to church on Sunday and our ushers are out there and they say, well, before you come in, we've got to take your temperature. Could you imagine that? But there was a, the cost of being of one accord, being on the same page, the same purpose, and the disclosure, the authenticity, the burning, the passion for what God wanted to do in our midst. We would never have Acts chapter 2 if it was not for Acts chapter 1. And in the same way today, I, I really believe God wants to do something spectacular in our midst. I, I feel like God has placed a burden on us to be part of something that would bless the entire state. This week we had a, a lady that said, I have friends in six different counties that I have invited to start studying the Bible with me. But there are conditions that God is looking for before he can give the gift, the gift of his presence. And they, we just need to take a moment and really think these things through. Are, are those conditions being met in me? The first condition we've, we've noticed here is the cost of obedience. Is there something that you know God wants you to do? It's time to start doing it. The cost of reconciliation, maybe there's a relationship that's been estranged and you're just, uh, God's saying, you know, you need to work on that. We need to mend the fractured relationship. Perhaps it's in prayer. This would be a great week to turn up the temperature on your prayer life. You let us know because next Sunday we're going to check in on our IOU challenge and see if we've hit the 500 in all three categories for the month of January. And just the one accord, everybody coming around together with the same spiritual fervor and passion. Before we um, just pull everything together this morning, I would like for us, uh, as you identify where the emblems are for the Lord's Supper close by, if you brought them in, hopefully you did, but reading through the book of Psalms this past week from the Passion Translation, there was a little nugget, and I think it was a prayer that was intended for us as we see the cost of Pentecost. Psalm chapter 51, verse 12, and the writer offers a very simple but powerful prayer like this. It says, let my passion for life be restored, tasting the joy of every breakthrough you bring to me. Hold me close to you with a willing spirit that obeys whatever you say. I would really like to ask you this morning not to even think about taking the emblems of the Lord's death, burial, and his resurrection until that's the prayer of your heart. Let my passion for life be restored. Maybe this week, maybe this month, maybe this whole pandemic has just squashed the desires out of your life. Let my passion for life be restored. God, turn up the heat in my life. Give me joy. Give me purpose. Let my passion for life be restored. 
tasting the joy of all the breakthroughs. You know the battle. Life is about God. Life is about God fighting your battles. It's about letting him in and letting him be victorious. The breakthroughs that he brings for me. Hold me close to you. And not begrudgingly, but voluntarily with a willing spirit that obeys whatever you say. Can you hear God's voice? Can you say, Lord, I want to be obedient? Boy, if that's your prayer, I want to invite you to take the emblems with me this morning. We want to take, first of all, the cracker representing the Lord's body. And we celebrate the incredible depth of his love offering that body on the cross. And let's take the cup together, thanking the Lord for the blood that was spilled and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. This past Tuesday night, we were doing a training uh, discipleship, just helping people to follow Christ more closely and bear more fruit. A man from Santa Fe, New Mexico, was on the call. He shared a little bit about a story. He's a CPA down in San Antonio. He says, I went to the University of Northwestern up in Chicago, and I thought I had made it. I had arrived. What could be better than this, he said. But as he, he said, as I sat there in my freshman year of classes and looked out the window, it suddenly occurred to me, I'm just going to be fertilizer the way I'm going. What purpose is there in life? Why am I even here? What am I doing? He began to consider thoughts of suicide. He went home that summer and discovered that his older brother had become part of a small group. They were reading scripture together. They were post high school friends and God started to move in that group. And he said, he had so much peace and so much purpose in his life. So he said, I went back to Northwestern my sophomore year of school, and I took the Bible with me, and in three months I read from Genesis to the book of Revelation, and I met God. He said, today when I go out to a restaurant, when I talk with people, frequently with the people that I interact, I'll drop a copy of the New Testament with a simple note that I hand right on the top. It says, this book saved my life. That message can save yours. And there are people that need to hear it as well. This book saved my life. You know, we want to help each person to take the next step, and that's uh, what we ultimately want to do. And if there's a next step for you and we can be helpful in that, I invite you after we're done this morning, we can meet up here. I'll just hang around for a while. We can converse. We also have the connection point out back. Uh, you can gladly walk by there, pick up a little gift that we have. Uh, texting also the word respond to the uh, in-church text, 740-303-7898. Very simple way to engage and, uh, and have people close by that want to help you move forward. That's 740-303-7898, respond. Listen, friends. Just got a text or just got a message here about Anthony, our friend that we prayed for. He just landed in Ethiopia. No questions leaving. Now we listen for how he wants us to reenter. I love and appreciate you all so much. <laughs> Praise God. Let's pray and uh, we will be dismissed. Father, we are grateful. There is purpose in life. There's passion. There's a reason to live. And thank you, Father, because you have overlooked so many crazy things from our past. You continue to love. You leave the 99. Father, we thank you for the story that continues to be written. May it be written this week in our lives, in the lives of the people that we interact with. May we find and may you restore passion in our lives. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed. Don't, take, uh, don't forget that you have other people around. Make sure you say something to somebody else. We will hope to see you next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great week.